Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Um, Arun Gupta as a director for developer advocacy at Red Hat. Um, and as Andre said, um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, talking about Wildfly 8. But before that, I would like to kind of talk briefly about JBoss middleware portfolio. So Red Hat JBoss middleware is a family of lightweight, cloud-friendly, enterprise-grade products that help enterprise innovate faster in a smarter way. In terms of Red Hat language, we call that as enlightened innovation. Effectively, all our portfolio consists of many products, and we like to call them in three different pillars. As you see on the bottom of the screen, there is Accelerate, there is Integrate, and there is Automate. In terms of Accelerate, we deploy, um, we give you the ability to deploy applications faster, deploy across any environment, physical, virtual, public cloud, private cloud, um, and elastically scale with fewer bottlenecks. Um, that's where our products like Enterprise Application Platform, which is a commercial offering for Wildfly, uh, web, web Server, Data Grid, Portal, um, Developer Studio and Operations Network, they all kind of sit in that Accelerate tier. In the Integrate pillar, uh, we give you the ability to connect systems, applications, and data across your enterprise for greater efficiency and precision. Um, and that's where products like Fuse, uh, ActiveMQ, data virtualization, and Fuse service works kind of fit very well. And finally, in the Automate tier, we give you the ability to automate business processes to reach quickly to real-time events uh, and minimize errors and stay competitive. And that's where our products like BRMS, which is a rule management system, or BPM, or business process modeling, kind of fit in there. So effectively, um, acceleration of application development, deployment, performance, and management. Then we give you the integration of applications and data silos, and then eventually uh, automation of decisions and processes. So this is sort of our overall um, pancake diagram for the middle work portfolio. Red Hat JBoss Enterprise Application Platform is the commercial offering for Wildfly. Um, and today we are focusing on really a very tiny piece of the entire um, enterprise middleware portfolio. So what is uh, Wildfly in that case? Well, Wildfly is, is what used to be called as, previously called as JBoss Application Server. The new name particularly is very relevant because it differentiates the community project from the commercial offering. So EAP is the commercial offering, and Wildfly is the community offering. So um, after JBoss AS712, the community offering was renamed to Wildfly. This is also the upstream project for JBoss Enterprise Application Platform. The main focus of Wildfly is to meet community demands, uh, specifically by rapid releases and latest in innovation. EAP, on the other hand, is focused a lot towards a more conservative branch which is battle-tested for mission-critical deployments. Wildfly provides a lightweight managed application runtime. Wildfly also provides a unified management layer fully integrated with all aspects of server and ex is exposed using a variety of APIs and protocols. This could be used to automate operational needs of any environment, whether it's a small JVM on a tiny server or thousands of JVM Spread across, you know, spread across the world. For JBoss, developer has always been the key. So from the very beginning, Wildfly is designed to be easy and quick to get going. It not only offers a rapid boot time, excellent developer tooling, but you know, it also provides you IDE agnosticism, which is very, very critical you know, in this developer-friendly world. Wildfly also implements the latest Java EE standards, so Java EE 7, um, and additional uh, open source innovative APIs. So while Java EE is the most common usage of Wildfly, but by no means is restricted to it. So for example, there's a project called as Torquebox. Now that Torquebox uh, provides a full Ruby on Rails experience on JBoss. Um, that project is leveraging the Wildfly architecture. So in that sense, it's also a polyglot, polyglot application server as well. And last but not the least, you know, just like every project product at Red Hat, Wildfly is also open source. So what that means is you, know, you, you can build your application, you can attach the source code of the application server to your application itself in case something goes wrong. This gives you the ability to figure out is there something wrong with my application or with the application server code. You can even go a step forward where if you don't 
if you don't find if you find a bug in the application server, you can even send a pull request. So um, it, it's a very satisfying experience actually to be able to fix a bug in the application server and send a pull request. So overall, um, um, this is sort of a brief overview of Wildfly. So what I'm going to do is, as I talked about, uh, Java E7 or Java E in general is the primary usage of it. So I'm going to switch uh, screens now, and I am going to go to IntelliJ. I'm looking at IntelliJ IDEA, but before I go there, let me go to the browser here and show you, for example, um, Java E7 samples. Now, Wildfly provides uh, is, is a Java E7 compliant server. So what that means is um, all the latest APIs, which is WebSocket, JSON, concurrency, batch, all of those are implemented in Wildfly. All the improvements in JAXRS2, JMS2, um, and all other specifications are very well implemented in Wildfly itself. Um, the best way, in my opinion, to learn about Java E7, we have about 200 plus samples um, on this GitHub project. So by all means, share it. Um, fork it, um, and you can see there are lots of folks over here. Uh, there are lots of contributors as well. So by any means, this is the best way to learn about Java E7. Uh, this is totally a community-driven effort. So in IntelliJ, you know, it supports very well um, how those nested Maven projects are supported, because effectively these samples are a bunch of Maven projects and nested Maven projects. So here, for example, you can see all the different technologies. You know, you want to learn about WebSocket. So you expand WebSocket here, and there are about 30 odd samples that you can learn about WebSocket. You want to learn about JAXRS, so you click on JAXRS, and there are all these samples here. Uh, then you can expand a particular project, say I want to run JAXRS client, and then you, know, you can um, try to run it over there. So now what I want to do is um, I want to see how I can get this running over here. So for example, I can go here. I can say edit configurations, and if I want to add, so let me clean up over here first of all. So this is what you see by default in your IntelliJ configuration. So I can click on plus here. I can add a new JBoss server configuration. This is local. It also allows you to add remote configuration. So I'm going to add a local configuration. Um, I'm using uh, Wildfly 8.1 CR2, which is the latest release as of yesterday. And I'm going to give it a name. OK, it gives me a local host. Um, I can, of course, configure it if I need to. So here, for example, I can say plus. Um, well, first thing I need to do is install Wildfly on my machine. So I go here. And as you, as you, as you see, there is this directory is completely empty. I have already downloaded Wildfly here. So I go to Wildfly CR2. And in order to get started with Wildfly, you just need to have that zip file. And you unzip it. Once you unzip it, you are basically ready to go. So that, that's all literally that is required. It creates this directory here. And we will look through the directory structure. But effectively, that's what it looks like here. It's got a bunch of directories and some files in there. Now if I go back to my IntelliJ here, I can say it is asking me for a JBoss home. So I'm going to click on here, and I'm going to say IntelliJ. Sometimes the directory may not, may not show up. Then you just click the refresh button, and the directory listing is refreshed for you. But you go here, and so let me refresh it again. And IntelliJ, I pick the Wildfly directory, click on OK, and it says the version is 8.1 CR2. So even though it says JBoss, but it's really meaning Wildfly. So I click on OK. All my classes, etc., are automatically picked up. I just take the defaults, click on OK here. And here it says no artifacts marked for deployment. That is OK. So I just click on OK here. Now, um, in my JAXRS client, for example, you know, these are all a bunch of tests as well. So here I am. You know, these are all JUnit tests that can be easily run using Arkillian. Um, so I can click here, and I can say run it. So this is going to start my um, uh, Wildfly server. Um, for now, it's only starting the Wildfly server. Um, and you can see the console over here. And Wildfly server starts up. And it just shows my default page. This is sort of my default page for Wildfly running at port 8080. Now, 
I want to run a particular test. So I'm going to right click here and I will say, or rather on the project, I will say run and I'll say run all tests. So now I'm going to run all tests and you can see the progress happening here. It's running the test right now and all the tests pass and it shows the results over here. So very easy, very quick, you know, um, one of the best ways to learn about Java E7, you know, open those samples in IntelliJ, navigate through it. Now what I showed you is just a simple Maven project opening up. So you say, what is Java E7 about it? So IntelliJ provides very extensive support for Java E7 in that sense. You know, whether it's uh, uh, EL markup, whether it's code refactoring, whether it's uh, doc, Java doc support, all those different configurations, all those different Java E7 technologies are very well supported in IntelliJ. Um, and of course, it provides support for Wildfly, so that makes it really easy for you. So um, you can learn Java E7 and Wildfly combination together in IntelliJ. Now, Wildfly, as I said earlier, is developer friendly, is by no means restricted to IntelliJ. Um, you can, of course, use NetBeans and JBoss Developer Studio as well, which is um, uh, Eclipse version of um, Eclipse plus a bunch of plugins that allows you to run Wildfly as well. Okay, so that's sort of my first part of you know, what I wanted to show you. Uh, now I just ran one simple test here, but as I explained earlier, you know you can you want to learn about JSR 352. So there are lots of batch samples here, and these are all Archelian tests as well. And if you feel motivated and inspired after the talk today, by all means take a look at the test, take a look at the samples send a pull request, file a JIRA issue. You know, we are always looking for contributions on that, right? So um, now development using IDE is cool. Um, sometimes you want to build in an environment which is uh, IDE agnostic. Um, and that's where JBoss Forge kind of comes in handy. So if I go here, for example, and if I go to the website called as forge.jboss.org, uh, this is a tool provided by JBoss community. Uh, this is the fastest way to build applications um, in an IDE friendly way, uh, well, rather in an IDE agnostic way. Okay, so let me kind of walk you through. I thought that I'll just do a live demo of it. So here we are. Um, well, first of all, in the browser itself, you can click on download 144 or Forge 2. Forge 2 is the recommended version. Um, so you click on Forge 2 and you download. You know, the full. Uh, it's a small uh, 40 megabyte download but that gives you complete tooling for your Java EE applications here. So um, I downloaded it, unzipped it, and let me run it here. So once I run the tool Forge, uh, this gives me what we call as a Forge shell. Um, now I'm in the Forge shell, I don't know what to do, so I hit tab. It says, ah, this is the list of commands that are available over here. So the first thing I wanna do here is, I wanna create a new project. Um, so I say project, and if I do it again, I say PR and I hit tab, it automatically does the code completion for me. So I want to create a new project. What is required then? Then I hit tab again. So it gives me a list of hints. Ah, so dash dash named is in a different color convention. That means that is required. So I'm going to, once again, type N and hit tab. So it says that named. And I'm going to call that as simple Java EE. All right. So then um, I can optionally provide, say, for example, top level package. So I do that. And I can say org for samples dot Java EE. Once I do that, my basic project, which is simple dash Java EE, is created for me. Um, now, here, uh, if I look at the listing, it shows me what exactly is created for me. I can say more of palm dot XML. It shows me the palm dot XML. So very simple. No, nothing fancy in there. It's a very bare bones palm XML that is created for you. Now um, I need to start adding capabilities here. So I say servlet setup, I say CDI setup, then I can say set up persistence for me, then I can say set up a rest for me. So you can really be modular in terms of what capabilities do you want this application to consist of. Um, I may want to set up bean validation constraints, so I can say constraint setup, then I can set up faces if I want to, um, I can also include EJB in there, oh, set up, okay? And then finally I can say, hey, by the way, I want some support for scaffold generation as well. So I do all of that and I hit enter. 
let me make it full screen. So once I do that, all these dependencies are automatically installed for me. And once again, if I look at pom.xml now, all these dependencies, annotation, faces, um, JBoss uh, um, API specification, all those dependencies are automatically added for me now, okay? Now the project is created and you can see I'm already in simple-java EE. Um, now in this project, what I wanna do is I wanna add some new entities. So JPA, that would be my entities. Then I want to create a new entity, so I do it that way. And then I hit tab again, and it says, oh, you need to provide the uh, named. So I'm going to say author. We're just going to do a very canonical author book kind of a sample. Then I can optionally specify the target package here. And I like to keep my entities in a package. So org, forge, samples, java, ee, dot, entities, say. Okay? So create a new entity. Uh, just like our shell, I can hit the up key and I can say add now a book entity here. So I added two entities, all right? So this is very clean. So once again, I do ls. Now I'm in book.java. So it's showing me the listing or the methods that are available in this entity. I, if need be, I can go to author.java and can do ls and go back here. So and I can go back to say, for example, book.java. So you're Commonly used shell commands are available here as well. Each entity, each element of the project is considered as a node and that you can traverse very easily. Okay. Um, now, if need I'm be. Sorry, Aaron. Uh, yeah. Can I interrupt you for a second? Just to, sure. to, uh, to add a note. Uh, I haven't tried it myself, but um, it's also possible to use a built in terminal uh, from uh, inside in DOG IDEA to use Forge, actually and all these commands, and uh, you benefit out of it, because, um, right, yeah, you see all the change you do via Forge uh, in the IDE immediately. So, yeah, it may be useful to also, like, uh, invoke all these comments from the uh, built-in terminal. So from Yeah, perfect, IDE. actually, and, yeah, no, awesome, actually, and, uh, and that's one of the things that I've been meaning to do, play around with, I just didn't get time to it. But eventually yeah, I'll yeah, do a screencast okay. where I will do all of this from the terminal within IntelliJ and then open the project in IntelliJ um, and then see how the changes are basically live. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry for interruption. No, that's okay. That's good. That's a good point. And by all means, you know, if you have any data points, uh, feel free to interrupt and you know, uh, kind of accentuate it. Thank you. Now I can do cat here and I can see the complete listing for my entity here. Um, you can see my ID, private, my standard, and also the the relevance of Forge is in an IDE independent way. You know, you can use definitely be connected with an IDE, but in an IDE independent way, you're generating a lot of your boilerplate code. Um, so it's sort of a also one way to say this is a domain-driven uh, modeling as well. Now I'm in the book entity, so I want to do a new field, and let's again see what is there. So I'm going to hit a named here. And to the book entity, I'm going to add title. This is going to be of the type, say, string. And I can set up, say, length. This is of the type length 100. Okay, so I just added a simple field here now. Now I'm going to add another field here, length 30, and say this is going to be an ISBN. Okay, so added two fields now. So now, as we did earlier, I can go to author.java, for example. And then I can add one more field here too. So here I'm going to say author name. So this is going to be, say, my name. Okay, so I'm going to say name. All right, so just some fields created for me automatically. Now I want to create a one to many relationship as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say in author itself, create new field. Then I'm going to say named. I'll call it books, for example, because an author can have multiple books. Uh, now, to the type, I can say org, forge, sample, and see how my package completion automatically worked. And I'm going to call it book. And then I can also say relationship type. And I can say, show me what relationship types can be specified. So then it says one, two, many. All right. So this relationship is automatically created. So very cool. All right. Now, um, if I again look at it, for example, and I go up here, 
you can see these relationships are created one to many you know the constraints have been automatic well the column has been added now I'm going to add constraints to it for example so I can say constraint by the way one point I would like to mention is earlier we were setting up each of those constraints earlier I filed a bug already on forge so uh, there there is a command which for which there's already a pull request so hopefully you should be able to say Java EE dash setup that I don't care about these individual components just do a big bang Java EE setup and it will set up all the technologies for you so definitely working towards more ease of use now I'm going to add a constraint here for example and I can say on what property let's say um, I'm in the author author as a name and what do I want here I want say constraint say size and I can say how much I want it maximum so 50 so there you go and my simple constraint is added now I do a cat here so here is my, my constraint simply added so you can add a bunch of constraints that way okay so now um, I'm not going to add other constraints I mean, although you can do that but uh, the fun is uh, here itself you can say build so this is going to build my current project and generate my target war file all those things but just by build itself is not sufficient uh, because eventually what I want to generate is I want to do a scaffold so I want to say scaffold and I'm going to specify targets um, and in terms of targets I can say show me the packages that are available so author is one so I'm going to generate scaffold for it automatically and I'm going to generate a scaffold for book automatically and there you go so that's my thing generated automatically and if I build it and it's ready to roll so very simple very easy straightforward so let's get out of our shell now if I go to my IntelliJ I can close this project I can terminate Wildfly from here and let me run this also. so now I'm gonna say import a project and we were in the IntelliJ directory so simple Java EE pick to the palm.xml click on OK take the defaults click on next it says yeah this is good picks my palm XML in the libraries click on next and generate the project so here's my project now and um, as uh, Andre was saying you know I would have could have done this all from our terminal here and then the changes would be visible right here itself but effectively um, you can see all the changes now here so my entities are generated for me my rest application is generated my views which is my scaffold basically is generated here so now here I can say okay um, edit configuration I'm gonna add a new JBoss local and I'm gonna call it as wildfly CR2 and this is 8.1 CR2 so go here fly say okay and now I'm gonna say run it so it's gonna run it Uh, this is my default page here now there are a bunch of ways by which you can deploy it and so I'm going to switch gears now and I'll show you how easy it is to deploy the application you can do that certainly from IntelliJ and I'm going to switch gears and talk about different command line options that we have or the ways by which Wildfly supports deployment of applications okay now in order Wildfly admin console uh, you need to add a user in administration realm so I'm going to do that now so I'm back in my console here I'm saying, oh, right here actually. I'm saying wildfly bin add user. I'm going to add a user basically here, okay? It says you want to add a user in the management realm. So, yes, I want to do that. I'm going to add the user as admin. It doesn't like them, say the user is easy to guess, but yeah, go ahead. It's just showcasing it. And it says the password. It's going to give me an error. Oh, this is too easy. So, no worries. Go ahead, add it. Um, so I'm going to enter the password. Just keep it simple, simple. You know, admin, admin is my password. Um, it's saying which group do you want this user to belong to? That will be relevant when we talk about RBAC. So hang in for there. Uh, you want to add the user in here? Yes. And this user is not going to be connecting from a remote server. So say no here. All right. So I added a user now. If I go back to my console, my web-based administration console is available on 9990. I hit here. It says username password. I log in here. 
Okay. Uh, this is my web-based console. Uh, you can see 8.1 CR2. You know, some quick accessibility of links. Um, common tasks are available over here. So I can say create deployment. Um, I can say add. I can choose a file. And I go to my directory here, which is IntelliJ, simple Java EE, pick up target, pick up my WAR file from here, say open. Okay. And I click next and I save it. Now I've um, done the deployment, but I need to enable it. So let's enable it. And I say confirm. So it's a two-step process. You know, the idea is you could deploy multiple applications on Wildfly and enable a particular version of it, depending upon how you're doing over here. All right. So now I'm here. So I'm going to go to 8080 and I'll say simple Java EE 1.0 snapshot. And you see, like in literally 15 minutes, you know, we could build a full Java EE application with rest of a, a JSF scaffold. I did a JSF scaffold, but you can very easily do a rest scaffold over there also. Um, you can also put all of these commands in a script so that, you know, you can give that script to somebody so that they understand how the project was generated. It allows you to do a reproducible products. Okay. Um, now I can click on author and I can create a new author. So I've written a book, so I'm going to create myself as an author. So create new. Um, now I can start assigning titles to me, but you get the point. It's a basic crudding application, but most of your boilerplate code is taken care of here so that you can quickly focus on um, adding your business logic to it. Okay. Now that's one way of deploying application. Another way of deploying application is um, if I go to Wildfly, for example, there is this tool here called as JBoss CLI or JBoss command line interface. Um, I can say dash C. That means it's going to connect using my default host and port. Um, I can, um, I maybe, I may have my Wildfly running on a different host and port, and that can certainly be specified using a dash dash controller option. So then I say what my host and the port where Wildfly is running. But for now, um, I just bring up my JBoss CLI. Uh, once again, just like Forge, I don't know what to do. I hit tab here. So it shows me the list of commands and it shows me this weird um, colon here. And the colon means that there are a bunch of operations that you can do over here. So um, let's say I want to try one operation first. So I say colon. I don't know what colons, um, what operations are available. So I say I want to read a particular attribute, for example. Once again, you can see command completion works very well. Um, what do I do? Uh, uh, let me do this this way. Okay. So command completion. Hit another tab, so it says, oh, you want, you want to do something with it. So what do I do here? Okay, so I need to specify name. Um, what names are available to me? So I'm going to say release name, for example. That's the one I want to get. Um, or release version, just say. So release version. I'm just reading that attribute, and it says 8.1 CR2. So this is a simple way by which I can easily um, configure or, or start reading attributes. The, 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 log, the logic here is that uh, Wildfly internal management model consists of management resources now that are added, removed, or modified by using operations and commands. Um, so these operations and commands allow you to kind of traverse through the entire management tree in that sense. And um, whether you do it using the web-based admin console or whether you use using JBoss CLI, either way, um, the everything gets persisted into the XML configuration file. That is really the source of the truth. They all read and access the information from there. So now we were talking about deploying an application from here. So I can say, I want to issue a command, deploy. Okay. Uh, now it's going to ask me, uh, what is, what do you want to do with deploy? So, okay. I'm going to take simple Java EE. I'm going to take target. I'm going to take this war file and I'm going to try to deploy it. So it says, oops, that doesn't work because that already exists. So I'm going to give that command again, and I'm going to force that deployment. So if I force the deployment, the deployment goes through. So I just showed you a couple of ways. Um, one is, of course, the web-based admin console on how easy it is to deploy the application. Um, then there is a JBoss CLI, which is a command line interface. You can do it. Now, what I showed you is an interactive way. I can also get out of here, and I can say deploy or actually command rather. And then I can say deploy simple dash Java EE 
and I can copy this entire command here and say deploy it this way. So the idea is you don't have to do it interactively. You can write a bunch of commands using JBoss CLI and force the deployment over here. Now, um, to summarize the deployment part of it, uh, admin console, web-based admin console was one way. JBoss CLI is another way. Uh, JBoss CLI is, by the way, very, very powerful. Uh, you can pretty much manipulate the entire management model with it. Um, but in addition, there is a GUI version of the JBoss CLI that you can play around with. I showed you the non-interactive way. There is also the traditional file system based deployment. So there is a auto deployment directory uh, or deployment directory rather. You just drop something over there and the file system scanner will automatically pick it up for deployment. Okay. Now um, we also have a Maven plugin that is very tightly integrated. So uh, if you want to integrate uh, how Wildfly is started, you know, you want to manage the entire runtime for Wildfly uh, using a Maven plugin, you can do that. And then you can automatically say, this project, you know, it's going to run on Wildfly. By default, you know, it, it refers to a particular Wildfly version. So if you have something running on 9990, it'll connect to that. But of course, that is configurable. So there are lots of ways by which you can play around with it. So um, I want to actually quickly show you here, uh, Wildfly Maven plugin. If I go here, so... And the reason I'm showing you this way because pretty much we all do development like that. So you go to Wildfly Maven plugin. Uh, there are all the details over here. Uh, you look at the deployment example. Um, it says, you know, what is the plugin that you need in project build plugins. Once you do that, um, in your build plugins, and you can actually specify this as part of the install um, lifecycle phase. So as you do the installation, it can automatically do the deployment for you. I wanted to show that, but I think we can, we're going to just jump ahead and show, show some other fun things. Now, development is good, uh, but eventually you want to start playing around with testing part of it as well. So I'm going to go here. So here, for example, uh, I have a Maven command, and I'm going to generate a project from scratch. I'm doing it in batch mode using an arch type which is the group ID here, artifact ID here. I'm specifying the arch type version and I'm specifying the repository as well, okay? I specify all of that. Then I'm saying for my generated project, use this group ID, use this artifact ID, okay? I'm gonna hit enter here. So what it's doing is, is basically generating a project for me, which is Java E7 project. Um, but it has a few profiles in it. And those profiles basically are configured for Arkillian. Now, Arkillian is really our, um, it, it, it's, as we say, it brings a test to runtime so that you don't have to manage the runtime from the test. Um, in a short sense, you know, it covers all aspects of test execution, whether you want to manage the lifecycle of the container, bundling the test case, you know, how the test case is bundled, how your archive is created using shrink wrap, how you want to deploy the archive, um, you want to enrich the test case by providing dependency injection, you want to execute the test inside or outside the container, capturing the results and generating a consolidated report. Arkillian provides uh, two different kinds of container. There is a remote container where the tests are run outside the, I mean, Arkillian is not responsible for the life cycle of the container. And then there's a managed container where uh, the Arkillian is responsible for the lifecycle of the container. And the both both of them have very specific use cases that, let's say you don't care about, you know, um, you, 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 specifically in your unit testing, you want to use a remote container because your container is started once. And then while you are running it, you just want to make sure you don't have, don't have to start and stop the container every time. In the managed container, the container is started and stopped every time. So um, that's sort of the workaround that you want to look at it. So anyway, um, if I look at the directory listing here, I have this Orkillian project created for me. So once again, I go back to IntelliJ here. I'm going to terminate Wildfly, which is running over here. I am going to import the project once again. And here is Orkillian. I'm going to import the project here. Take the defaults here. And these are the different profiles I was talking about. So it says uh, Wildfly remote, Wildfly managed, Glassfish remote, and Glassfish managed actually. So here I can say, for example, I am going to do Wildfly remote Arkillian because my Wildfly is already running outside. Um, click on next, 
click on next, take the defaults and finish it off. Okay. So here is uh, my project generated. Now if I look at my, um, yeah, please reload the project for the language changes. Now if I look at my palm.xml, um, here is um, a profile that is commented out, but Wildfly Managed Archelion is there. This is one profile. So if I can minimize this guy here. Oh, okay, anyway, Wildfly Managed Archelion. Then this is Remote Archelion. This is the one that we care about. Um, and the way um, we can execute this here is, so for example, I can say, well, let's go back here for a second. And in here, I'm going to fire up my Wildfly. So I'm starting up Wildfly, bin standalone.sha. That just runs my um, single instance of Wildfly, recommended for the development mode. I go here, and then here I can say run all tests. Okay, it's going to pick up the default profile. It's going to run the test against Wildfly, and there you go. So literally in one command, in one Maven command, you could generate a project that has all the Java E7 dependencies in there, that has Arculean profiles built in there, all the Arculean dependencies specified in there, and ready to test. That's pretty cool, I think, in my opinion. And all of this can be very easily done from within IntelliJ as well. So um, yet another cool thing that you need to be aware of. Now, switching gears a little bit. So I'm going to stop my Wildfly instance here. So let's take a look at it. So here in my Wildfly directory, for example, there is a standalone directory, and then there is a domain directory. Wildfly can be started in two different modes. There's a standalone instance, which is a single uh, Wildfly instance, and then there's a domain mode, where you, this is centrally administered, managed uh, in a domain administration server. And there are multiple instances that are running across. Each of those could be configured for high availability, so it's not really tied to high availability per se, but what I'm going to show you is how easy it is to configure high availability in the domain mode. Um, so in order to run my Wildfly in the domain mode, I'm going to say bin domain dot shop. Okay. So this is going to start my Wildfly. Um, it's going to start my administration server and my two instances. By default, that's where it starts. Um, and it starts pretty rapidly, actually. So in about four seconds, the whole thing has started. Okay. So I go here, go to my localhost 1990, and it automatically took the profile, uh, the admin login name, which is shown on the top right here. Um, so now if I look at my runtime aspect of it, it says, oh, by the way, um, you have a main server group, which has one server and two server. So two servers are there, and there is other server group, which has just one server, which is server three. By default, it's running on port 8080, so the offset is plus zero. Server 2 is running at port 150, which is at offset 150. Um, if need be, I can actually stop the server from here. So I can say stop the server. I can stop it. If I need to start the server, I can start the server. Okay. Now, I want to show high availability, but before I do that, actually, I'm going to go into domain mode, and I'm going to talk about server groups. So server group is a console, is a collection of servers that are belonging to a particular profile. So in this case, for example, I have a main server group and an other server group. Other server group is in the full HA profile. That means it's a full Java E7 platform with high availability enabled. Okay, So that's good. Now if I look at server configuration, it is say server 1 and 2 are in main server group. Server 3 is in other server group. I'm going to select this, copy it, and I'm going to add a new server in that same server group. And I'm going to set up the port offset as 350. So 150, 250, and 350. So those are my three servers now configured. So I got server 3 and 4 in other server group. OK, so that's good. I go to domain now. And here it says server 3 and 4. So now I can say, OK, this server is not there. Um, this server is basically stopped. And I want to start this group. So I'm going to start this group. So it's going to, by effectively by starting a group, it is starting the server instances in that group for me. OK. So the servers are started now. Um, now I want to go back to my deployments. I want to deploy an application here. So I'm going to add an application. Click on Choose File. 
and this time is in a different directory. So wildfly samples clustering and by, by the way wildfly samples is on the github repo as well on my github repo so click the target pick a just a very trivial um, file which shows session uh, replication I click on next here click on save now I need to assign this war file to a particular server group and in our case it was other server group that we cared about specifically in the full HA profile and it's automatically enabled too so go here and click on it now my application is deployed. Okay, oh, on the window. So now my application is deployed. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to take a look at say 8230 or actually 8330. So this is my server three running. And if I copy the URL, open up a new tab, and I say 8430. So server three and server four are running. Now in server three, I'm going to try to access my HTTP application. So this is how the data looks like. Session failover in Firefly shows me some debug information. I can add some uh, session data here. So let's add simple session data. Say foobar, add session data. It shows me the value here. Then I can add say foo2, bar2, and I add two values here. So those two values are added now. So if I go to my admin console now, and I say show me the overview then remember this was here in server 3 it says this is data is coming from server 3 so I can go here I can say stop server 3 and my server 3 is stopped here okay server 3 is I, I hope it stopped it says request timed out we'll find out I guess so now here if I try to refresh it it says oh could not connect so the server 3 is down now if I go on server 4 and I say show me that application the session data is automatically available for me what I did for you here is port hopping in the sense I showed you 8330 and then 8430 I hopped from port to port but typically in a production environment you will have a load balancer running in front of it and then load balancer will automatically figure out oh this 8330 is down let me round robin to 8430. So it may be sticky session. If it's not sticky session, but on the back end, what's made what's made sure is your HTTP session is replicated to the number of nodes in your cluster. Um, and how how many nodes is the session replicated to? That is again a configurable property. Um, and literally, what I'm showing you is just a basic basic um, uh, implementation right now. Uh, this could be really fancy, you know, in terms of once you start plugging in InfiniSpan or JBoss Data Grid and things like that, um, it becomes a lot more fun. Um, I, I wanted to show a couple more things. Uh, rather, I would talk about one and then show the other one because that's an IntelliJ feature as well. So one of the features that I wanted to talk about is RBAC, um, which is basically a role-based access control. Now, role-based access control um, is the ability to restrict access to system or certain portions of it to authorize users. So here, for example, in the admin console, when I logged in, I am super user. That means once I log in, once I have the credentials, I can do whatever I want to do here. Uh, but this is a experimental flag. I can say run as. These are different roles that has been defined in Wildfly. So what is a monitor? Monitor is the lowest level of capability where you can only monitor. So I can, for example, run as monitor here. I reload my admin console here. Now, if I click on create deployment, I can only monitor. I cannot add any deployments. So I just showed you a very basic sample once again. But the idea is you can define different groups, different users, assign them roles. And depending upon their capability, they would be allowed access to certain portions of admin console. This feature is particularly very important if you're going uh, for mission critical deployments where we have a huge deployment team, um, and that's a very critical aspect. Okay, and the last thing that I want to talk about today in terms of development, um, you you may say I don't want to download Wildfly, I just want to get a feel for it first. So OpenShift, OpenShift is Red Hat's uh, PaaS platform. It's fully open source once again. There are three different varieties of it online which is uh, where we are right now I mean, you can literally sign up for free no credit card required 
There is origin version where you can download the source code, run OpenShift on your laptop, and there's a private cloud version as well. So now, in terms of online, so if I log in, for example, it shows my applications that are available over here. You can create multiple domains. You can see I've got two domains over here. I can add an application here. Um, and there are lots of um, cartridges. Well, OpenShift has a pluggable mechanism by which you have multiple cartridges. So you can have multiple cartridges uh, running over here. So you can say Jenkins, all the JBoss products in terms of XPass, and that's probably a topic for a different webinar anyway. But all your Java cartridges are available. So I want to do a simple Wildfly cartridge. So I'm going to choose a name. All I need to do is just specify the name, public URL, Wildfly 8, or I could say my Wildfly 8, for example. Okay. If you have your source code, Java E7 application running in a source code, or Java E6, you can specify the source code to here. It will automatically pull the source code. Um, gears is a mechanism by which you define how much CPU and memory you do need. And this small gear is good. That's about half a gig of memory. And I'm going to create the application. So basically what's happening now is OpenShift is going, um, looking at different nodes, which is the physical box on which is saying physical or virtualized box. And then it's saying, oh, by the way, on that node, I'm going to provision that gear. I'm going to provision that gear. And on that gear, I'm going to provision this particular cartridge. And then I'm going to create the source code. So it's going to, it's doing, going through all of their drill you know, right now when, I'm, when this circle is going uh, crazy over here. Um, so the idea is, literally with a click of button, you can provision a uh, Wildfly instance in OpenShift. Um, CloudBees also provides this support, uh, but uh, OpenShift coming from Red Hat definitely has the latest support over here. As you can see, this is 8.1 CR1. Um, uh, the CR3 tag has been cut, I believe, and the final is expected soon. So once that is there, that will be published right here itself. So what happens is once this application is created for you, is going to give you a pointer to um, a Git repo. Um, so now what, what you can do is you can take that Git repo and you can import it into your um, in, in IntelliJ. And then IntelliJ provides first class support for OpenShift integration as well. So I'm going to wait for this to complete. But in the meanwhile, I am going to close this project here and wait for this to complete. Uh, let me see if there are any questions in the meanwhile. It's going to take a few seconds to complete it. Oh, there you go. Well, let's, let's wrap it up first, and then we'll go back to the questions in that case. OK. So here is my GitHub repo. So I'm going to just copy the Git URL. It gives me my user ID port. Uh, uh, password credentials as well. So I'm going to copy the GitHub repo. I'm going to check out from version control. This is a Git. I'm going to paste the URL here, and I'm going to say my wildfly8. Okay. Click on clone. It's going to clone that repo. I'm going to add this to the list of known hosts. Yep, that's okay with me. Open it. Yes, please. Open it. And here is my wildfly8. So here is my project that is open for me, OK? So this is my simple source main web app. This is index.html. This code is automatically all generated for you, OK? Now, if I go here, um, I can also say continue to application page. I go here, and it's going to show me my application page. Welcome to your Wildfly application on OpenShift. Um, kind of shows you how do you get started, all that stuff, OK? Now, in Wildfly, or in IntelliJ, actually, I can say I want to edit the configuration. Now, I want to add an OpenShift deployment, OK? Remember, I'm not doing a local deployment now. It supports local deployment, but I'm doing an OpenShift deployment now. So I'm going to call it as OpenShift. The application name is automatically uh, available to me. This is my Wildfly 8. Um, this is the server that I'm picking up. Now, if I click here, um, well, I have already pre-configured it, but if it's a brand new IntelliJ instance, then you can create a new OpenShift instance here, and you can even test the connection. 
So you can say, okay, my connection works good, so that looks good. Uh, if it's, again, once again, a brand new IntelliJ install or never been configured for OpenShift, then you will also see a button here by which it will allow you to upload your public SSH keys. So a lot of focus has been done to provide a seamless experience to integrate with OpenShift. Okay, so this is good. Um, I'm going to do this deployment on OpenShift. Click on OK here. And now I can say run it. So it's going to take my deployment, it's going to take these files, add to the Git, and it's going to start the deployment here. So it's going to take some while to do the deployment, but you effectively get the point um, that all of this experience is available, integrated from within IntelliJ itself. So now I can go down here, for example, I can start changing values here, and I can say deploy again, and then it's going to do the deployment and show me the application URL. Take some time. So I won't show you to the completion of it, um, but that's pretty much the end of the webinar. I'm going to conclude with some references. So in the beginning, I talked about enlightened innovation, how we have accelerate, integrate, automate, um, how we provide support in all different parts of the middleware. Uh, you can find all about that at redhat.com slash jbus. You can learn all about Wildfly on wildfly.org. Of course, it's completely open source. Uh, we talked about Forge, so you have forge.jbus.org, and then you will have everything about Arkillion at arkillion.org. If you want to learn about the broader JBoss middleware portfolio, once again, redhat.com slash JBoss. Uh, Java E7 samples are available on all of these URLs, on this GitHub URL. And of course, um, IntelliJ, I'm going to conclude with that here. So believe in IntelliJ, so click on IntelliJ the best Java and Polyglot IDE. And myself, if you are interested in following me, uh, I'm Arund Gupta on Twitter. All right, so that's all I have. And let's see what questions do we have now. Okay, thanks Aaron for great presentation. Yeah, uh, it was really uh, interesting, um, at least uh, for me personally. Uh, Especially part about uh, G, uh, for, uh, G Forge and Aquarian, yeah. And I, th I guess we can cover uh, questions. Uh, we've got a few, uh, and I can go through the list of them. Please. Uh, meanwhile, uh, yeah. If uh, um, if you have any questions, yeah, feel free to ask them right now. Uh, we we've got uh, five minutes uh, to answer them all. So first question is about how to automatically deploy uh, the application to Wildfly uh, uh, without IDE uh, and I guess uh, uh, it's meant here how to deploy it via the build system and I guess Aaron mentioned uh, that there is a plugin, Maven plugin, which you, which you can use to deploy an uh, application automatically yeah, there are several ways actually. Um, so there's a Maven plugin as part of the build system. You can use that. That definitely works. Um, just uses your local host and 9990, which can which is configurable. So you can do that. Uh, then I showed the JBoss CLI command. You know, it could be run in non-interactive way, so that works as well. Um, then uh, there is a file system-based deployment where you can just drop a directory and there's a scanner which scans that directory and automatically does the deployment. What I didn't get to show today is uh, how people have done deployments using curl. Uh, they have done using PHP. They have done using Java. So there are all sorts of different APIs that are available because effectively the deployment is done using a REST API. You know, it's a DMR encoded uh, pay payload. So it's all over REST. So you can definitely do your build your own system to do the deployment. But there are several ways by which you can do the deployment in a non-IDE way. Yeah, uh, I really like uh, that there are uh, many ways to, to do uh, one thing. You can use ID, you can use uh, a click command, yeah, and you can use, of course, uh, the plugin from your boot system. I, I, I wonder if uh, there is a uh, plugin for Gradle? Uh, I will, I'm not sure, actually. Yeah, I need to check on that. Somebody asked me that, but let me make a note of that today. Yeah. Okay. If there is one, then I will, um, you know, that's a good topic for my blog. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, another question is how to deploy it automatically from uh, IntelliJ IDEA. And 
yeah, uh, Erin uh, hasn't covered it, but it's really simple. Once you have uh, run configure, uh, configuration for Wildfly, you can go to deployment tab. Yeah, we can open it right now. Uh, yeah, we can switch to Wildfly run configuration. Or you can open the previous project. Here? Oh, no, not this one. Okay. Let me open the previous project. Yeah, uh, that's really simple. On the deployment tab, for uh, there are um, uh, uh, so you can yeah. Let's open it. So go to deployment tab, which is second tab. Yeah, and here you can simply add uh, an artifact. Yeah. Since you use Maven, the ID uh, fetch all the information about artifact automatically, and yeah, you can just choose any artifact you you'd like to deploy. Yeah. So yeah, now, n n now when we run it, you know, every time you run this particular configuration, because it's this information is stored in the configuration, so you run it, it will automatically be deployed to um, Wildfly, this particular instance of Wildfly. Yeah, exactly. Yes, and uh, another question is on the default provider for GPA. So is it Hibernate or uh, Eclipse Link or? Yeah, so uh, Wildfly JBoss, the default persistence provider is always Hibernate. Mm -hmm. And uh, because Wildfly is Java E7 compliant, um, so Hibernate uh, is uh, JPA 2.1 compliant as well. Now Hibernate provides a lot more other features in addition to um, JPA 2.1. Um, as a matter of fact, um, there's a recent study, literally, uh, I think it had to be released by zero turnaround, where it talked about how uh, Hibernate is the most leading persistent provider in all of applications. Um, and I believe 65% or 63% was the number for Hibernate, but then after that, the next one was about in the range of 15 or so. So Hibernate is definitely the leading persistence provider. Yeah, I've, I've seen the report as well. Yeah, uh, looks impressive. Uh, and okay, go to the next question. Uh, uh, how to easily uh, transfer application from Glassfish to GBoss? Oh, awesome. I love that topic. Um, so let's go here. Go to wildfly.org. And if you go down here, uh, there's an article which says migrating Java EE app from Glassfish to Wildfly. So that's one article um, that is very useful. Hildeberto Mendonca and Ephraim Gentle from Sierra Jug in Brazil, they wrote this article for it. Most of it is about migrating uh, your resources, you know, because those are the ones that are defined in application server specific way. You know, how do you define your JDBC resource, Java mail resource, secu security realms, and all of that. So a lot of it is about that. Uh, in addition, you can lo also look at, um, say, WinDrive. Um, so there's a full uh, migration portal. So there is a windup, uh, there's a WinDrive, and QBMA. These are three different projects that you want to take a look at, and they serve different needs. They kind of look at your existing project and tells you uh, what are the gotchas that you're going to face when you're migrating from one application server to anything that is JBoss. So these are very useful to look at. Okay, and one more question uh, about JAS, and I guess it's supporting Wildfly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, JAS is part of uh, Java E7, so it is supported on it. Although um, there has been some discussion on how security can be further simplified, because security, um, as we all know, is not the easiest thing to do anyway, and in Java E is definitely not very easy. So hopefully that will be dealt in the Java E8 time frame. But until then, yeah, Jazz, Jazzpick um, are sort of the way to deal with it. OK. And next question is about IntelliJ IDEA. And uh, which version of IntelliJ is used in, in the demo? And if it's necessary to install uh, any plugins uh, not included into the day, I, I can actually uh, answer it myself. Yeah, it's a team's version of uh, IntelliJ IDEA, and you don't need uh, to uh, install any plugins because uh, support for GBoss um, yeah, comes out of the box with the IDE. And I, I think I personally love that feature of it where it provides me a seamless out-of-the-box experience 
Um, and that's one of the reasons um, NetBeans and IntelliJ are favorite because you know they just come bundled everything with it. Eclipse by itself is not very pretty in my opinion, but if you want an experience where you want that seamless experience, then JBoss Developer Studio definitely provides that experience where it has everything bundled in, Maven, um, JBoss plugins, Wildfly plugins, all of those are bundled in. So in that sense, the three IDEs are very comparable, but yeah, uh, really important to not mess with the version and the kind of plugins. Yeah. Uh, okay. And about uh, support for Java 8 in Wildfly? Now, uh, Wildfly is Java E7 compatible uh, or compliant. So um, Java E7 only requires JDK 7. So that definitely would work, JDK 7. Um, Java 8 was released after Wildfly 8, but we have been working very closely with the Oracle team uh, in running all of our test suite. We have thousands of tests that were running regularly on Wildfly 8. So those all are, those all have worked. Um, I think around a couple month ago or so, somebody found a bug. Uh, if you are using Lambda code in your entities, um, in a particular corner case, then it wasn't working. But that wasn't that was found to be, I think, a false alarm, or there was a fix already in place for that. But other than that, we highly encourage the community to go try out their projects on JDK 8 because. Wildfly 8.1 is ready to go live, so if not there, um, if you find any issues, there, those can definitely be fixed for Wildfly 9. And that's sort of the advantage of Wildfly because it moves on such a rapid pace um, that you know, if you find a bug, there's a likelihood it will be fixed rather soon. Yeah, uh, okay. And uh, there is a question uh, on why Tomcat uh, uh, has been changed for Undertow in JBoss 8, and what are the main benefits? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, we didn't dig into Undertow part of it. Now, up until JBoss AS7, um, which is a community version, and even JBoss EAP 6.x, uh, JBoss Web was the underlying web server, and that was using Tomcat as the base for it. Um, but we realized that the web server is such a critical piece, if not the most critical, it's such a critical piece of an app server that pretty much everything goes through it, you know, at least the entry point goes through it. So what we decided was, you know, it's probably time to rewrite, leverage the latest and the greatest APIs, breaking any backwards compatibility and all. So we decided to write Undertow. So what I want to show you here is, if I go to this website, techempower.com slash benchmarks, uh, this website runs uh, benchmarks um, on a variety of different um, frameworks, but the term framework is very loosely used uh, because, as you can see, um, Gemini, Undertow, Netty, Servlet, Grizzly, these are all kind of considered as um, frameworks. But the key point is rewriting that web server, the biggest advantage it gave us was, you know, how Undertow can scale really well. So, you know, and here you can see Undertow is among the top three. If you do query here, Undertow is right here. If you do multiple queries, you know, Undertow is right at the top itself. If you do fortunes, these are different categories in which they were running this test. So Undertow is among the top as well. Data updates, uh, where is my Undertow here? Oh, ooh, that's too low, that's not good. Uh, plain text, um, Undertow again at the top. Um, I also wanna highlight, so I'm gonna show you something here. Under two benchmarks files to go. So if you look here, for example, they uh, did the comparison. Uh, I don't have the numbers here, but one of their um, uh, round nine results. Uh, I'm missing the real link actually. Um, but uh, one of their results actually um, showed how under two was able to scale up to a million concurrent connections every second. This is raw undertow. Um, yeah, this is raw undertow. They, in a 30 second time frame, they were able to do 31 million concurrent connections. So lots of benefits, lots of advantages um, by going undertow instead of Tomcat. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so we running off time uh, a bit. Uh, so I'll answer just 
uh, a few more questions and uh, uh, but uh, all the questions we uh, uh, hadn't answered we'll yeah we'll send answers in full up uh, email and we'll also publish it uh, along with the recording in our blog so yeah yeah so by, by all means you know send the questions to me I'll be happy to answer each one of them uh, uh, and then we can publish them cross publish them yeah okay just just one uh, last question uh, it uh, is on OS GUI and it is a question is any ad, uh, advice about OS GUI application development with Wildfly environment and IntelliJ IDEA so about IntelliJ IDEA yeah um, uh, it's on our roadmap Th there is already uh, some uh, I would say uh, not complete um, uh, support for OS GUI and there are some requests on it and it's uh, uh, it's a part of our uh, roadmap on 14th version so uh, the user experience with OS GUI should, uh, should be improved uh, uh, soon so yeah and second part of question is on OS GUI support with Wildfly yeah, so uh, while fly, uh, up until JBoss AS7, we used to have an OSGI module that was bundled as part of JBoss AS, but we didn't really see a lot of community demand or customer demand for OSGI, so we pulled the module out of Wildfly. That module is still maintained separately, so if you are interested, you can grab that module and drop it into Wildfly and you know, see if that works, um, but yeah, there is no active work happening on it right now. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for your time. Yeah, for great and for great presentation. Thank you. You are very welcome. Yeah, as I've said, recording will be published tomorrow in our blog. Uh, so uh, let me. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, uh, be sure to check uh, IntelliJ IDEA uh, and Wildfly websites and. Uh, also, stay tuned to our Twitter account for more webinars and just other news. So, thank, thanks to all, uh, to everyone. We'll see you next time. Yeah, and have a good day. Thank you, everybody.